The new head of the Climate Change Commission says he's not convinced there's enough evidence to declare a climate emergency. Rod Carr was today named as the chair designate of the independent group, which was formed to help the government enact its zero carbon bill. The Climate Commission has been tasked with providing the government advice, guidance and recommendations around five yearly emissions budgets. Dr Carr is a former chair of the Reserve Bank and University of Canterbury Vice-Chancellor. I asked him whether he agrees that climate change is this generation's nuclear-free moment. I think the transformation of the resources that are allocated in our society and how they're used and how it impacts on households, businesses, local and central government is all-pervasive. I think what we have here is the need to change how we all live our lives. And to do that progressively and aggressively. Now, whether that's a nuclear-free moment, whether that's the disruption to our trade and economy from the reforms of the 70s and 80s or the oil price shocks, it's going to be hard to calibrate that it's anything except at least as challenging as all those transformations. So are we in the middle of an emergency or not? I don't believe at this stage that I have the evidence that would enable me to give you an answer. What I do know from what I have read and understand is that we need to act now for tomorrow may be too late. So you're heading up this commission, but you can't tell me at this point in time whether you believe we are in the middle of a climate emergency. I think the term climate emergency uh, is used in a political context and that is a regulatory tool that a government of the day may choose to use. For the Commission to consider or advise on whether that particular tool should or could be used is something I am not in a position to provide you with the answer to that question on. Would you, would you describe yourself as cautious? Well, I think it depends entirely on the context in which decisions are made. Um, I describe myself as many things, and one of them is a realistic optimist. I believe that New Zealand can address its emissions and can adapt to the likely changes that are required. But I believe to get that adaptation and reduce our emissions, people need to understand and believe that the actions are reasonable, realistic and necessary, not because somebody tells them to act, but because they choose to act for good reason. But can you deliver on what is required here? Because the Commission's, well, recommendations are exactly that, just recommendations. You have no power to compel the government to do anything. So I'm wondering whether that leaves you a little bit toothless. I think the nature of our democracy is that the hardest of choices have to be made by the elected representatives that we choose. And that, I think, is something the government has thought carefully about. It recognises that there are hard choices that need to be made, and it was not prepared to hand that obligation to unelected officials. That puts the responsibility on the Commission to work to understand the evidence that informs those hard choices. That evidence is provided in public for public scrutiny. It's provided with an opportunity for consultation so that the wider community can see the nature of the advice that's being provided to the government. The government is under an obligation to receive that advice, to have it publicly displayed, and to respond to that advice by either taking it or rejecting it, and in the case of rejection, explaining why and what it proposes to do instead. So I think that it does give the power to the Commission to essentially, through transparency, put options and choices in front of a government and force that government to confront those choices very openly. But you know, you've been around long enough to know that governments do not always do what is required or needed because they're elected on a very short-term cycle and in particular the issue that you're dealing with is intergenerational beyond, beyond their time in government and sometimes preserving their position takes precedence over doing what is right and what is needed, doesn't it, sometimes? I think, I think that's a fair description of how politics often works, but it's not a description of how politics inevitably works. I think our communities 
provide governments with the courage sometimes to make difficult choices. And that's part of what the Commission's job is to do. But it's partly why there is a legitimate role for protest, there is a legitimate role for advocacy, and a very important role for education. Tell me, do you think that farmers are getting a free pass at the moment with, uh, with the proposal under the Zero Carbon Amendment Bill? Well, the government is still considering how it will respond to the submissions and proposals, including those from the in Interim Climate Change Committee. Yes, uh, but the coalition... Sorry to interrupt you, Dr Carr, but the... To decide. Mm. To, sorry to interrupt you, but the coalition agreement obviously predetermines the parameters here, and so that's what I'm referring to specifically. The coalition agreement says that if the Commission determines agriculture is to be included, then agriculture should get a free allocation of 95%, with all revenues recycled back into agriculture. Is that a free pass for farmers? But I think the other thing to remember is the government's expressed intention to phase out all of the free carries over 30 years. So it's not a free carry forever. It is part of a transition and transformation agenda. A three-decade transmission. So are they getting, uh, well, a light hand here? I believe that we are all going to have to make significant changes in how we live our lives, the products we consume, uh, and that includes the farmers, and I think they're up for it, as is business. Uh, the government has said that we all need to do our bit in terms of climate change. So you personally, how are you walking the talk? You were in Auckland today. How did you get here? Did you take a plane? Do you own a fossil fuel vehicle? Do you still eat meat? Can you give us a bit of a rundown? Yeah, so um, we have a farm forestry box that uh, we put in in the 1980s that we won't be uh, cutting down. Uh, it sequesters uh, about 5,000 tonnes of carbon every year, uh, and we continue to support that and the native bush on it as well. So there's a, there's a family, personal kind of answer to that question. Um, 35 of the last 40 years, I have walked to work or taken public transport. And in the five years when I didn't, it essentially was a shared ride with my wife and kids as we took them to school. Um, I eat a lot less meat than I used to, and I observe that New Zealanders are among some of the biggest meat eaters in the world at over 100 kilograms of meat and bone per annum for each of us, compared to China at about 55 kilos and India at less than five. So I think there are ways in which we can adjust our habits around what we consume. Um, yes, we do have a petrol-driven, petrol-powered car, uh, and it's probably the last one we will actually own. And that's Dr Rod Carr, the new chair of the Climate Change Commission.